Focus on Headline. And let's take a look at what major issues are making the headlines today on Focus on Headline. For this, joining us in the studio, we have our reporters in Kwanzaa and Yoon Hae-jung. Guys, welcome back. Hello. Good to see you guys. We're going to start things off with that NATO summit over in the U.S. capital, Washington, D.C. Uh, that, of course, uh, with the participation of South Korean President Yoon sung yeol for the third straight year. Uh, NATO leaders issuing a summit declaration, dubbed the Washington Summit Declaration. Quite confusing because we also have the Washington Declaration uh, from last year. Uh, this includes a condemnation of North Korea's weapons transfers to Russia. So are you going to start us off? Give us the details. Sure. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, in a summit statement strongly denounced North Korea's exports of weapons, mentioning artillery shells and ballistic missiles, which are a violation against numerous United Nations Security Council resolutions. The declaration also expressed a great concern of the deepening partnership between North Korea and Russia. It condemned North Korea and also Iran for supporting Russia's aggressions in Ukraine with direct military support, including ammunition and unmanned aerial vehicles. Uh, the statement, in fact, uh, said they are fueling the war. The declaration said these actions seriously impact Euro Atlantic security and undermine the international non proliferation regime. NATO members also warned that Iran's transfer of ballistic missiles and related technologies to Russia would constitute a significant escalation of tensions. They also criticized China in regards to Russia's war in Ukraine, blaming Beijing for playing its part in Moscow's aggressions by providing essential weapons components and other technology needed for the rebuilding of Russia's military. Uh, quote, large-scale support for Russia's defense industrial base, unquote, was mentioned. And uh, they also said that uh, China cannot enable the largest war in Europe in recent history, quote, without this negatively impacting its interests and reputation. So this is uh, pretty interesting because it's a pretty strong st statement. Yeah. Uh, until 2019, the 32 member alliance had not mentioned China directly in this way. And also, uh, I mean, China has not been actually supporting the war in Ukraine, but it is um, not directly, but indirectly uh, helping um, Russia with these uh, components and so forth, although it's not actual weapons. Now, this a joint declaration was issued on Wednesday local time on the back of the 75th anniversary of NATO this year with the members and other invited partner countries gathered in Washington, D.C. from Tuesday through Thursday. Staying with the NATO summit, uh, NATO Secretary General Jan Stoltenberg uh, is highlighting that the organization is determined to strengthen its partnership, especially in the Indo-Pacific region, uh, while stressing a great potential for cooperation with Seoul on technology, cybersecurity and information exchange. As you know, uh, the IP4 has been uh, also invited to the NATO summit. Uh, Hejong, let's get more on this. Right. Speaking at a press conference in Washington on Wednesday local time, NATO Chief Jan Stoltenberg said that the alliance will address common challenges through the so-called expanded NATO meeting taking place on Thursday, where South Korean President Yoon suk yeol and the leaders of three other Indo-Pacific NATO partners, Japan, Australia and New Zealand, have been invited. During this meeting, leaders are set to discuss cooperation in the defense industry as well as military exercises. Secretary General Stoltenberg said that wars are fueled by countries that do not share our, our values, uh, like Soa mentioned, noting that Iran and North Korea are directly providing military support to Russia, and China is fueling the war by supporting Russia's military economy. He also went on to describe Russia's cooperation with North Korea, China, and Iran as a major strategic shift and not a tentative alliance of convenience, and said that when the time is right, you Ukraine will join NATO without delay, emphasizing that Ukraine's accession to NATO is just a matter of when it will happen. And according to the NATO chief, the alliance will coordinate training for the Ukrainian armed forces at facilities in NATO member states, noting that a NATO-wide security and training assistance program for Ukraine will be launched. He stressed that if the, that this does not make NATO a party to the conflict, but it will help Ukraine uphold its right to self-defense. 
Now, specifically regarding South Korea, the NATO chief said that NATO and South Korea are exploring ways to enhance information sharing to strengthen security. Uh, Stoltenberg said that NATO is also exploring how it can work more closely with South Korea, including expanding defense industry cooperation. He, he also acknowledged huge potential for more cooperation between South Korea and NATO members in the technology and cyber domain. Again, this is going to be quite concerning right now because um, the general consensus that the Ukraine war happened uh, in the first place, uh, obviously an illegal invasion of uh, Russia, but uh, Russia has not been very happy with the idea of NATO expanding, uh, mind you, expanding eastward towards uh, Russia. And so I, I have to look into this a little bit carefully because, I mean, what many said was that if you look at the, the history uh, between, uh, what is it, uh, Ukraine and uh, then uh, Soviet Union, uh, there was some agreement in place that uh, Ukraine would not join NATO and so forth. Others are saying that there is no agreement in place. But nevertheless, so Russia has always said there needs to be a buffer zone. And uh, Ukraine wanting to join NATO uh, is going to completely get rid of that buffer zone. And this is why some people are arguing uh, the war in Ukraine has happened. And so uh, it's some ways controversial, uh, which is why it's also very difficult for Ukraine to join NATO. I mean, any country to join NATO, it's actually kind of very difficult in the first place. But now this gives even more uh, reasons for Russia to continue their attacks, right? And we've been re seeing that uh, Russia has been not only just uh, conducting massive airstrikes, but it's it's pretty brutal airstrikes. I mean, targeting like children's hospitals and you know, damaging civilian facilities and so forth. And so you kind of have to wonder now what's going to be Russia's response, right? If there's indirect NATO, I, I mean, some people might say this is actually a direct NATO involvement uh, in the war in uh, Ukraine. And uh, mind you, NATO is a military alliance. So we'll have to see what happens moving forward here. Uh, President Yoon Sun-yeol holding a string of meetings with his counterparts from various nations on the sidelines of the NATO summit. Uh, so I'll fill us in on some of uh, President Yoon's key summits. Right. Uh, President Yoon, whenever he's abroad, is busy holding marathon meetings with other leaders, this time not being an exception. Uh, he spoke with seven counterparts for around four hours on Wednesday local time upon arrival at the Washington Convention Center. And uh, in particular, security issues were discussed, uh, how to cooperate in response measures against North the North Korea-Russia bond, of course, and uh, in regards to economy, the construction of nuclear power plants, semiconductor key mineral cooperation was discussed as well. So uh, President Yoon had uh, limited time to talk with each of these um, uh, counterparts, so 20 to 30 minute summits. He had talks with the Chancellor of Germany, Prime Minister of Canada, Prime Minister of the Netherlands, Prime Minister of Sweden, President of the Czech Republic, and President of Finland, and uh a uh, Japanese prime minister as well. So his first meeting was with his uh, counterpart from Germany. He met Chancellor Olaf Scholz. And uh, President Yoon said that uh, the two countries are uh, important partners in Indo Pacific, in the Indo Pacific region, and that the bilateral relations are also important in supporting Ukraine. Uh, the two vowed for close cooperation in global issues like supply chain disruption and climate change. These uh, comments actually coming from the German Chancellor. President Yoon, meanwhile, welcomed Germany's application for the membership of the United Nations Command. Now, this compares to the former Moon Jae-in administration when Korea was not on that uh, stance. The presidential office said that uh, President Yoon is looking forward to Berlin fulfilling its necessary role as a UNC member and that related procedure procedures are soon to be completed. And uh, now moving on to President Yoon's meeting with his Canadian counterpart, Justin Trudeau. 
President Yoon hoped for a systemized security cooperation between South Korea and Canada following the 2 plus 2 Foreign Affairs and Defense Ministry meeting in September 2022. Prime Minister Trudeau agreed and the two also reviewed how to build up Canada's defense sector and increase its military power. And uh, President Yoon and uh, Prime Minister Fumio Kishida from Japan also held a meeting. They noted the recent moves by North Korea and Russia, with uh, especially the elevation of ties to a comprehensive strategic partnership, seeing eye to eye on that these developments pose great threats to not only Northeast Asia, but the entire world. President Yoon also discussed fresh cooperation on nuclear power plants with leaders of four countries, the Czech Republic, the Netherlands, Sweden, and Finland. Now, the South Korean leader is also likely to hold a one-on-one with his U.S. counterpart, Joe Biden. Uh, early Thursday local time that is predicted, South Korea's presidential office earlier today said the two have topics to discuss, so they are in efforts in making a meeting happen. I guess because, of course, uh, President Biden is also very busy currently. I guess they need to arrange uh, a time for these two to have official talks. Yeah, there's also a lot of uh, pressure on uh, Biden right now. Uh, this is kind of uh, considered the, the last chance to, to show that uh, not only can he hold his position uh, as a world leader uh, before the, the Democratic National Convention, uh, but, uh, I mean, there's been a lot of other news coming out that uh, he might not be able to, even if he does get elected a fourth year for another four years, he might not be able to carry that. Uh, and so... There's that. But uh, I'm surely, though, uh, there must be some sort of discussion on whether or not uh, South Korea will finally uh, assist uh, Ukraine with some lethal weapons. Right. I mean, I, I know the U.S. kind of came out saying that, uh, you know, we're, they'll, Ukraine is happily uh, they'll happily take any kind of assistance uh, from uh, South Korea. But given the fact that, you know, North Korea and uh, Russia signed a comprehensive strategic partnership uh, treaty, uh, and they came out saying that they'll reconsider uh, the whole policy of non-lethal weapons. Uh, you would wonder whether or not this was mentioned. Uh, but uh, for now, it seems like South Korea is uh, keeping its uh, stance on that uh, non-lethal weapon support. Speaking of which, according to Russian state media TASS News Agency, the country's deputy foreign minister claimed that the North Korea-Russia treaty that we just talked about here uh, will serve as a warning to those who seek to resolve the crisis on the Korean Peninsula militarily. Now, I thought it was just mere weeks ago that they said you should not probably look too much into this. And now this sounds like a pretty big threat. Uh, Hejang, tell us what Moscow had to say. Right. At Wednesday's session of the Valdai Discussion Club, which is a Moscow-based think tank forum, Russian Deputy Foreign Minister Andrei Rudenko said, quote unquote, From the very beginning, we have believed that the North Korea-Russia Treaty will play a stabilizing role in Northeast Asia, and at least it will serve as a warning to those countries that have plans or even wanted to build some illusions about resolving the problems of the Korean Peninsula and Northeast Asia in a military way. Perhaps they will be less willing to try this in practice. On a related note, last month, uh, the same senior diplomat w- met with South Korean ambassador to Russia, Yi Do-hun, and urged the South Korean government to reconsider its confrontational policy of provoking an escalation of tensions on the Korean Peninsula. And as Russia and North Korea recently signed the treaty stipulating immediate military assistance in the event of an attack on either party, uh, observers have suggested that China may be uncomfortable with this acceleration of North Korea-Russian ties. But Rudenko recalled uh, that a similar agreement was concluded between China and North Korea back in 1961. Taking this into account, he was confident that Beijing will show understanding over evolving ties between Moscow and Pyongyang. Uh, The Russian deputy foreign minister added, quote, We are in close contact with China regarding the Korean peninsula issues and our relations with other countries. So I believe that our friends in Beijing should not be worried. In the meantime, the Russian foreign ministry has diagnosed the Korean peninsula as being in a dangerous stalemate and urged both North and South Korea to refrain from mutual provocations and accusations and start negotiations. 
According to Russia's Foreign Ministry's International Organizations Department chief, uh, the situation on the Korean Peninsula has reached a dangerous stalemate due to the constant escalation of tensions, uh, adding that the main responsibility for the current situation lies with the United States and its allies in the region who stubbornly follow the path of confrontation and provoke North Korea. The chief added that Russia is not interested in escalating the conflict on the peninsula, calling on the calling on both Korea, uh, South Korea and North Korea to resolve the issue peacefully through negotiations. You know, um, speaking of this weird thing going on with uh, China amid the, uh, I guess, the, the strengthening military ties between uh, Russia and North Korea, China is, I, I don't know if you guys heard this, but they, they recently called on uh, North Korea to, you know, ret- return mm-hmm. all their workers, like, en masse. Uh, I think North Korea said, listen, and we'll take them out gradually, right? They said, no, 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 no. Their visas are expired. I want all. We want all of them out, right? Which is a big blow to North Korea, given the fact that I mean, it's like one of the few countries where they're able to get hard currency, uh, foreign currency at that. Uh, and so you can clearly tell that uh, you know, despite uh, you know Xi Jinping uh, and uh, North Korean leader meeting in the past and so forth, that uh, things things are a bit weird right there. So uh, we'll we'll see uh, how things pan out. Uh, Seoul's defense ministry. In the meantime, plan to make a change in North Korea-related duties within the ministry. Uh, so what, tell us more about this reorganization. Right. Uh, not only does the unification ministry deal with North Korea policies, but also the foreign ministry and the defense ministry, and they all have their own sub-departments and so forth. The defense ministry is looking to reorganize its North Korea policy office to put more focus on sanctions policies against the North while diminishing its duties related Related to inter-Korean military engagement. Now, this plan includes even a renaming of the North Korea Policy Division, and the move comes amid South Korea's government having put more work into implementing unilateral sanctions against North Korea. As we have been seeing, the UNSC sanctions appear to be not enough and uh, obvious in the recent military partnership between North Korea and Russia that we have been talking about extensively. Uh, the reorganization and redistribution of tasks should enable South Korea to preemptively and actively respond to threats from Pyongyang, namely its continuous developments of nuclear and missile provocations. Uh, As for the reducing of tasks regarding military agreements between the two Koreas, obviously there is not much engagement right now. Uh, There have been no regular talks, not even the, the phone calls between the two militaries that they used to have. Uh, Instead, uh, North Korea continuously is sending trash carrying balloons, tries to jam GPS signals, and so forth. So inter-Korean ties have been deteriorating visibly, seen in not only North Korea's actions, but also in defining the South as Pyongyang's, quote, invariable principal enemy through the North Korean leader Kim Jong-un's revision of the country's constitution. So uh, I believe it's not only the ministry trying to focus more on, you know, protecting the South Korea from North Korea's threats, but it's made Maybe even with the renaming, they are also trying to, you know, have a uh, signal towards North Korea by doing this. Uh, we got some interesting comments from, uh, let's see, a crash override over in Michigan. Now, one of the things I think China is worried about regarding North Korea's solvency is what it could mean for their own border. They don't want all those refugees. Well, I mean, I mean, they're, they're workers. Uh, they're, they're not the refugees. The refugees that we're concerned with uh, is the one are the ones that defect to China. And but China repatriates them, right? Uh, and I, th- in that case, yes, China does not want uh, the defectors or the North Korean refugees. Uh, he also says, I've often wondered if South Korea has a mass reintegration plan ready if and when the North does collapse. <laughs> Pretty much. But uh, it's, it's going to be a tough one. Um, I mean, if there's like a coup, right, that they decide they're going to overthrow the Kim regime or something, uh, maybe it's possible. But uh, it's a... Uh, it's a big thing, and it would mean a huge, huge financial burden uh, for South Korea if a reintegration or a reunification plan is set in place. Uh, let's move on here. Leaders of NATO member states on Wednesday pledging continued support for Ukraine against uh, Russia's war aggressions. Uh, this was one of the main agenda items uh, for this year's NATO summit, uh, given the fact that there's been, I guess, uh, decreasing support 
right? Uh, not a lot of people, everyone had the Ukrainian flag in their profile pictures in the first few months and now everyone's like all right enough is enough you know that's too much money here uh but at least they're, they're going to be supporting some uh, 40 billion euros that comes out to more than 43 billion us dollars annually uh, over the next year or so. Uh, Hedging, let's get the details of this. Right. In the joint statement issued by leaders of NATO in Washington, it described Ukraine's desired NATO membership as an irreversible path and said they would actively support its efforts to join, but did not lay out a specific roadmap for it, its accession. They only confirmed that they will be in a position to invite Ukraine to join NATO if allies agree and the conditions are met, with no mentioning of the specific timing of Ukraine joining NATO. Uh, in the meantime, the NATO leaders pledged to provide long-term security assistance to help Ukraine against Russian aggression. Uh, to that end, they would be providing at least 40 billion euros to Ukraine over the, over the next year, and a sustainable level of security assistance to ensure Ukraine's victory in the ongoing war. Uh, NATO has decided to establish a NATO security assistance and training unit for Ukraine in Germany to serve as the headquarters for co coordinating military equipment and training provided to Ukraine by member states. NATO also decided to establish a NATO-Ukraine Joint Analysis Training and Education Center to enhance interoperability between Ukraine and NATO. Uh, in the meantime, U.S. made fighter jets, the F-16, donated by NATO member states, have begun to be delivered to Ukraine with the aim of being deployed as early as this summer. Uh, the joint statement released uh, on the sidelines of the NATO summit revealed that Denmark and the Netherlands F-16 jets are being transferred. Uh, Belgium and Norway are also going to be donating F-16s to Ukraine. Uh, but the number of aircraft initially scheduled to be transferred was not disclosed for security issues, uh, but the total number of F-16s from the four European countries uh, is predicted to be more than around 60. Uh, but Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky called for additional support, saying that until we have 128 fighter jets, we will not be able to confront them in the Russian skies. Uh, the Ukraine president has also pointed out uh, the slow training for F-16s, uh, but the United States, which is providing Ukraine with a training program to operate F-16s, has said that it is difficult to expand the program due to the limited size of training facilities. You know what gets? Uh, you know what's a big question here is um, there are. I have to look this up. Uh, Twenty-three members. Uh, in common with NATO and EU member countries, right? And we know that not only has the United States given a lot of money uh, in financial support to Ukraine, uh, some 175 billion US dollars uh, in five different uh, bills that were passed under the Biden administration, uh, but uh, the EU has given 156 billion. Now, if there are countries within NATO that's agreeing to uh, support the uh, the 40 billion euro uh, financial aid. I think they're going to divide this based on the country D GDP. I think that's that's the way that they're working on this. Then does that mean there's there's going to be less support or any support whatsoever from the EU bloc uh, is the other thing. And then you also have to take into consideration, let's say, uh, Trump comes back into office and I could almost guarantee that he is not going to try to give any money uh, to Ukraine also because he also said he's going to end the war in a day. Uh, so that's no support anyways. So is this really good news, right? I mean, you're, you're practically looking at just $40 billion uh, in, uh, sorry, $43 billion in financial aid in a span of a year, which sounds like a lot. Uh, but in actuality, when you were getting that much money from both the United States, the EU and so forth, is it going to be as much? It's going to be far less. Uh, if you take into the Trump consideration and if EU countries are not going to continue to fund if they're already doing so with the NATO alliance. So uh, a lot of uneasy, I think, uh, results uh, for Ukraine. I have to look deeper into these figures, I think. Uh, let's move on to some domestic economy news here uh, in line with market expectations. Uh, the Bank of Korea, South Korea's central bank, are keeping its policy rate unchanged at 3.5%. 
This for the 12th straight session amid a number of uncertainties. Uh, so well, tell us more about this. Right. The Bank of Korea at its first rate-setting meeting in the second half of the year, or fifth one of 2024, <coughs> decided to freeze its key interest rate at 3.5 percent, where it has been remaining since February 2023, or 12 consecutive sessions. Prior to that, the BOK had delivered seven rate hikes between April 2022 and January 2023. The freeze was a widely expected decision. In a poll by the Korea Financial Investment Association, 99 out of 100 experts saw a rate freeze coming this month. Although inflation has eased to the 2% level, uncertainties are attributed to the freeze, such as soaring household debt, a continued weak local currency, as well as a delay in the U.S. Federal Reserve's rate cuts. The BOK in a statement also said trends in a foreign exchange market volatility needs to be monitored. Consumer prices saw a 2.4% on-year increase from June, remaining below the 3% mark for the third consecutive month, but it's still above the BOK's midterm target of 2%. Household loans have been up for three consecutive months in June, up by 6.3 trillion won or $4.56 billion, the biggest growth in 10 months. According to BOK Governor Lee Chang yong Two out of six members of the Monetary Policy Board see a potential rate cut coming within three months. He said the central bank will, quote, review the timing of a rate cut based on exchange rates, household debt and real estate prices. Experts say the government is taking a cautious approach as it assesses a premature rate cut more risky compared to a delayed one. So we're probably still going to see a steady 3.5 percent policy rate in August. Yeah, uh, the what is it? Uh, real estate's the big one because if you're going to start cutting rates, it's uh, obviously good news for all those people that bought those houses uh, when they thought it was going to be zero interest for the rest of their lives uh, and get some, uh, you know, less pressure on uh, paying for their mortgage. But on the flip side, it's going to lead to the real estate prices to soar again, uh, which means people that didn't didn't get to buy. buy Houses, it gets just more expensive and you take out more loans. That's more money that you have to pay for. There's more de debt uh, that you're going to the country is going to own. Uh, the S&P 500 continuing to hit fresh records on the Wall Street, uh, breaking above the 5,600 mark for the first time. And uh, I believe in like six trading sessions since they broke the 5,500 mark. Uh, this is because of uh, some increased market expectations that a rate cut by the U.S. Central Bank will come sometime uh, September. Hedging, let's get the figures. Right. At the New York Stock Exchange on Wednesday local time, the S&P 500 closed at 5,633.91, up 1.02% 1 from the previous session. Like you've mentioned, it was the sixth trading day since the index broke through the 5,500 mark last Tuesday. The tech-heavy Nasdaq advanced 1.18%, also hitting an all-time high, ending at 18,647.45. The Dow Jones Industrial Average added 429.39 points, or 1.09%, to close at 39,721.36. The hike came as market investors are building expectations of a rate cut uh, later in the year, coinciding with Fed Chairman Jerome Powell's remarks to Congress on Wednesday. Powell said that the U.S. is no longer an overheated economy with a job market that has cooled from its pandemic era extremes and in many ways is back where it was before the health crisis, which suge suggested the case for interest rate cuts is becoming stronger. In the meantime, the rally was led by big tech stocks, artificial intelligence Starling NVIDIA climbed 2.7%, while stocks of Qualcomm, Broadcom, AMD, and Micron also rose. Apple also rose 1.9%, widening its gap with Microsoft as the world's largest tech company by market capitali capitalization. The Philadelphia Semiconductor Index also surged 2.4% to a record high after TSMC posted strong quarterly revenues. You know, the thing with uh, Jerome Powell that uh, upsets a lot of investors is he'll come out saying things like this, like it's no longer an overheated economy and, uh, you know, things are, you know, inflation is moderating, it's easing. It looks like, uh, we, you know, 
all he doesn't say there's going to be a rate cut in come September. Like he never says that, right? But these are hints. And then he'll go, but we need more data. <laughs> and then they go, okay, what, what does that mean, right? Uh, and so I mean, it's it's still we don't know yet. But uh, that's the market consensus. Right, what is it like? Something like uh, I forgot how many of the nine. Uh, what is it? The policy board members uh, said they kind of expected that a rate cut would come uh, September, but uh, it seems likely that it'll happen. Uh, South Korea, in the meantime, continuously dealing with high fiscal deficits. So, uh, give us the figures that were released by the government earlier today. According to the finance ministry on Thursday, South Korea's fiscal deficit stood at over 74 trillion won, or f- roughly 53.6 billion US dollars, in the first five months of the year. That's a rise by 22 trillion won or more than 40 percent on year and marks the second biggest figure for the January to May period. The worst shortfall was in 2020 at almost 78 trillion won on the heels of the government's distribution of cash handouts to support those hit by the COVID-19 pandemic. The fiscal deficit increase is attributed to weak corporate performances while state expenditures have been growing. The government's total revenue went up by 1.6 1.6 trillion won to 258.2 trillion won in the same five months. However, tax revenue declined 6.3 percent to 151 trillion won on the back of a plunge in the government's collection of corporate taxes. In terms of total expenditures, an increase of 23 trillion won to 310.4 trillion won was recorded. Uh, the finance ministry explained the government spent more on diverse welfare programs. The managed fiscal balance, which measures fiscal health after excluding the balance of social safety funds, posted a deficit of 74.4 trillion won. I mean, kind of wonder, right? You have all these conglomerates coming out saying that they're recording record profits. I think Samsung Electronics recently came out saying that, uh, the, what is it, a 15-fold increase in profits, and you'd expect maybe some uh, corporate taxes to be collected here. Well, hopefully it gets better, right? Maybe because that's what they said it was going to happen for the, uh, the what is it, uh, the second quarter, and so they'll probably get it later on. Uh, South Korea filing a suit to reverse an international tribunal's recent order to pay 32 million U.S. dollars in compensation to a U.S. hedge fund, uh, Mason Capital, over the controversial 2015 merger of two Samsung affiliates. Uh, Hejung, what do we know so far in regards to this? Right. According to South Korea's Ministry of Justice on Thursday, the suit filed by the South Korean government is in response to the Permanent Court of Arbitration's April ruling in an investor state dispute settlement case that Mason lodged in 2018, demanding over 32 million U.S. dollars in compensation. Now, the problematic 2015 merger is uh, was seen as aimed at tightening Samsung Lee Jae-yong's control over the family-controlled group. Uh, it has been at the center of a massive corruption scandal that led to the ousting and the conviction of former President Park Geun-hye as well as the imprisonment of Lee. Mason has accused the Park administration of exerting excessive influence in the state-run National Pension Service, a major shareholder in Samsung CNT to cast its vote in favor of the merger. Mason claimed damages due to what it alleged was the South Korean government's unfair intervention in favor of the merger of Tail Industries and Samsung CNT, in which the fund held a 2.18% share. Mason argued that the intervention resulted in the merger being conducted at undervalued prices for Samsung CNT due to the firm's falling stock prices. But Seoul's Justice Ministry concluded that the PCA erroneously erroneously interpreted the conditions for jurisdiction recognition under the South Korea-U.S. Free Trade Agreement, resulting in an unfair ruling. The Justice Ministry also argued that the tribunal uh, considered unofficial misconduct by individuals, including former President Park Geun-hye. Uh, it further contended that Mason was wrongly recognized as a legal owner of Samsung CNT shares, when in fact it was only a general partner acting on behalf of a fund in the Cayman Islands, uh, the Cayman Funds, which is the actual owner. Cayman Islands, this is where all the all those secret monies uh, stashed away. But one of the arguments that was used by the uh, the Seoul government was that the NPS, the National Pension, uh, oh, sorry, NPS, right? Mm-hmm. National Pension System Service is not, it's separate from the government. 
but it's literally the state run right right uh, you know NPS and so they were saying well no it's state run it's it's kind of operated on behalf of the what is it the, the Ministry of Health and Welfare I believe and so you still have uh, a lot of responsibility in this and that's why I mean the the, the what is it the court ruled in favor of uh, Mason uh, what is it uh, Mason capital in regards to this all right, uh, guys, as always, thank you very much uh, for your reports. By the way, uh, what was it? Uh, one of our listeners uh, called uh, Soa the, the, what is it, the beatbox princess. Uh, <laughs> she's a queen. She, you know, princesses are young. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I thought you meant queen as in she's like... Higher ranking than a than a princess. <laughs> the age, guys. Wow. Thank you very much. Have a safe one. Stay cool, and uh, we'll see you again next time. Thank, thank you, you, Monarch. <laughs> you can listen to Korea Now with me, S.J. Lee, by downloading the Arirang Radio application, or tune in online by visiting www.arirangradio.com. So make sure you tune in Mondays through Fridays, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Korea time.